So how many opportunities for meaningful feedback do you create in your company every year? Is it one, 10, 100, 1,000? You know, we just heard of this importance. I just remembered that I forgot my clicker. I'll be right back. <laughs> See, we're in constant feedback. Even if we think we don't have a lot of feedback happening in our organization, all we have to do is look to the field of biology to understand that every system is in constant feedback with itself. Your body has over one trillion cells constantly communicating to each other. And so there's so much wisdom, there's so much valuable information, but we need to get good at listening. We believe that there's a technological and generational sea change happening inside of the business world that is driving this need to get better at continuous feedback. And you know, the, a culture of continuous feedback with win-win communication is kind of the opposite of a culture of continuous gossip with lose-lose communication. And so think about where you're at on that spectrum. Is there a lot of gossip with negative dynamics at play where people are talking smack about the people they don't like or the negative interactions they're having? Or are they, like our panels were talking about, resolving these issues directly? So Josh Burson, who's one of the analysts in our space, says that more than 85% of stock market capitalization is intellectual property, brand, services, and software. So every person matters. This is a big change. We're flipping the org chart. It used to be, if you were the boss, you were the executive in the room, all of you, you were at the top. It was a command and control structure. Systems of feedback weren't that important. It wasn't important to ask your people how they feel, what's going on. You gave orders and you expected them to be fulfilled. You, you set the structure and people can kind of go through the motion. You needed cheap labor. You needed people that would follow orders. And that's changing. We've even gone through just the need for phys strong physical labor into we need knowledge workers. And we're moving into a new era. Claude Silver, the chief heart officer of VaynerMedia, who if you don't follow on LinkedIn, you should. She says that we are moving into the era of the intelligence of the heart. That is actually emotional courage, it's vulnerability, creativity, that are really going to be the things driving the new economy. And so we as leaders, as business leaders, we need to think of ourselves as, as coaches, as facilitators, to help unlock the potential of our people. So your mission is, you know, we need to attract the best talent. We need to keep them. And then we need to maximize their potential. We need to stop thinking of our people as human resources. You know, resources, look it up in the, def the dictionary. It is something to be, you know, consumed, extracted from, and essentially let go of. We need to view our people as potential to be unlocked. Employee lifetime value. Most of us really track customer lifetime value. How much money does it take for us to acquire a customer? How long do they stay and how much money do they spend with us? Raise your hand if you know your customer lifetime value in this room. You can probably all learn a little bit more about your customer lifetime value. It's a good thing to know. But employee lifetime value is something we should really be studying closely. You know, pure, pure economics, it costs between one and four X the annual salary to replace somebody. All the training, all the onboarding, all the recruiting, very expensive. If you get some of the things that we're talking about today right, this is what's possible. 
You can shorten the time that somebody's in your company producing value. You actually raise the ceiling of how much value they can contribute over time. You know, you can actually hit a plateau, think about, huh, I'm not fulfilled. And if you have continuous feedback, you can have that conversation. You can get crunchy. And you can have a breakthrough. You can reinvent yourself inside your organization. You can continue to grow. You can ask for what you want. And you can ask people what they want. And ultimately, then, it becomes a much easier transition once that person has actually come to the natural completion of their cycle with you, they'll actually tell you. And they're not going to phone it in for the next six months. Which is, think about how much money that costs you. Think about the lack of engagement, the uh, defeat that, is, that internal experience it is when you're at a company and you're not committed to it. You're, you don't actually want to stay there. All you're thinking about is, what's my next job? And you, you start to live that lie rather than actually knowing that your company has your back and wants the best for you. So the big news flash that business relationships are no different than personal relationships. It's all relationship. Great feedback comes from great relationships. Great companies are made of great relationships. Great products arise from great relationships. And so in this game of business, what we're really talking about is that we want to get better at relationship. Feedback, just relationship skills. Emotional intelligence. Something that hasn't been valued by the business community. And it's something that we want to change. We want to say, damn straight EQ is important. You know, it's not something that we're really measuring on our tests. Our standardized testing doesn't measure whether somebody's good at asking questions, how much resolve and determination they have. These other aspects, these vital aspects of a thriving human being. So there's this myth that work and life and balance. We've got to create work-life balance. I've got my work over here. I get to go home, take off my button up, put on a t-shirt. Then I have my life. It's a myth. Life contains everything. Your work is your life. Your life is your work. And what we want to do, given that this is probably more accurate for all of you, is we want to, we want to make it worth it. We want to have some of the best experiences of our life at the office. These peak moments of, of yes, I am, I am living a life worth living. You know, was it, was it Thoreau that said the unexamined life isn't worth living? So how can we help create conditions in which people are examining their life while they're in our companies? And are really actually like, yes, I'm, I'm growing in self-awareness. I've learned new things about myself since joining this company. I've gained new skills that I'm bringing back into my life. How cool would that be? I was talking with a bunch of chief people officers at a breakfast the other day. And we were saying how all these leadership development skills, learning how to think more like a coach, learning how to give and receive feedback, learning how to really lead in this, this way, all of it is really, it's actually just becoming more human. That's all it is. To be a great leader is fundamentally about becoming a better human being. There's a Lakota phrase, uh, matakuyasin. And what it essentially translates to is to all my relations. That there's this, this value of, hey, I am connected to all of you. I am your business partners. I'm your friends. 
Somewhere here in the audience is Tiffany Elston, who I went to high school with, and we haven't seen each other in a long time. Am I a good friend to her? Am I a good son? Am I a good husband? Am I a good coworker? Am I a good co-founder? Am I a good boss? Am I a good manager? Am I a good coach? We're deeply connected to each other. So it's really helpful to understand some of the mechanics of effective communication. And you know, I don't have nearly enough time to talk about a lot more of these things, but just a couple of ones that I think are really valuable is this idea of the golden ratio of feedback. So Dr. John Gottman, who was a marriage counselor, did this fascinating research. And he uh, was able to sit down with a couple, watch them solve a problem together, and in two minutes could predict with 90% accuracy whether they'd be together in five years or not. Two minutes. It's terrifying if you think about that. <laughs> and the same thing applies to business relationships. And that is that you want five emotionally positive interactions for every one negative interaction. For every crunchy conversation, have five, uh, I don't know, smooth and silky conversations. <laughs> and it really starts with appreciation. Most organizations are appreciation deficient. We're coming out of this uh, you know, our kind of archaic hangover of psychology that believed that if you showed affection to your kids, you'd break them. Anybody familiar with that idea? You know, anyone that grew up in the 50s or before? That was the, that was the status quo. If you, if you really show your appreciation, you're going to break them. And now we have this idea that if you appreciate your people, they're all going to become entitled millennials. <laughs> it's not true. Appreciation is fit so many, fulfills many human needs. You want to create a culture of belonging, of deep inclusion? Start with appreciation. Start to uh, thank people. Most of us don't thank the people in our lives enough. You know, there's always people like have a near-death experience and holy shit. Life is precious, and I'm not actually expressing my love to the people that I love, to the people that I work with and I contribute to and I'm contributed from. Feedback loops create opportunities for course correction and contribution. So if you're not in that feedback loop, you can't coach anybody. You can't say, hey, I see you're doing it this way. Have you thought about trying it this way? Or, hey, that's amazing what you just did. I really see how it actually is leveraging your strengths. And did you, do you understand the impact that has on our customer? All of that happens within communication. You want to change some fundamental beliefs about feedback and ultimately about yourself. So Carol Dweck wrote Mindset. Show hands of who's read this book. Great. So really important book that I think is actually foundational before we actually get into uh, building effective cultures of communication. So basic premise is this, fixed mindset, and these are just two different beliefs, and they're just beliefs, beliefs we can hold about ourselves. In a fixed mindset, my skills, abilities, and intelligence are a fixed trait. You know, I, I, have, I have an IQ, that's my IQ. I, I can't sing well, I can't sing well. End of the story. Growth mindset is, no, all my, fit, my skills, abilities, intelligence, they're variable. All of us can actually get smarter. That's really good news, people. We can, we can improve our memories. We can improve our eyesight. I can learn to sing. I could get better at chess if I wanted to, because I really think I suck at chess. But that's just a fixed mindset. And we're all operating on fixed mindsets. And why this is so important is that when it comes to feedback in a fixed mindset where you don't think you can change or improve, the natural outcome is to see feedback as a threat and something to be avoided. In a growth mindset, oh, feedback. 
I get a better perspective on myself. It doesn't mean that I have to believe the feedback. You know, they say that feedback always uh, sometimes says something about the person receiving it and always says something about the person giving it. And so it's about being engaged with the feedback, regardless of whether it's true or not. But then you can be in a constructive, ideological conflict with the feedback. And so what we're wanting to do is create this kind of continuous cycle where you're doing asynchronous check-ins, where you have opportunities to engage in self-reflection. You're asking questions. You know, ask your people how they're feeling. Ask them where they're stuck. What's going well? That leads to more powerful one-on-ones, where you can move from a transactional, great, let's do a status update, or, oh boy, I'm relieved that that one-on-one -on -one got canceled, or that I canceled it, and into transformative, life-changing, career-developing conversations that tracks into your OKRs so that there's a purpose, there's alignment around this is what we've said is most important. Let's stay on track. You know, a rocket to the moon is off course 90% of the time, and it's constant course correction. Work is crazy reactive, in case you guys haven't noticed. There's a million distractions every day. It's hard to stay on track. We need to continue coming back to what is most important. Where's the leverage? How can I have the most impact? How can I say no to things and say yes to the things that really matter? That goes into you know, quarterly reviews, quarterly, biannual. We need more than once a year performance reviews. I'm sorry. It just is not cutting it. And then that's all peppered in with continuous appreciation, with saying thank you for the work that's being done, recognizing those accomplishments, recognizing contribution. There's some companies who are starting in their performance reviews. 50% uh, is measured on business contribution, and 50% is measured on cultural contribution. Are you contributing to the people around you? Are you being a generative force in the company? Are you questioning the status quo? Are you actually giving feedback above you? So it's not that this is easy. It, it's actually incredibly hard to get this in motion and to build momentum. But what is so cool is that there are, are hundreds, if not thousands, of companies that are doing this well and are really actually paving a way for a new world of work. And you think about what would be possible if these ideas take root and we as, as leaders start to help our people be and become a best version of themselves. You becoming a better version of yourselves through your companies. That is a world that I believe is possible and I really invite you to participate with us. So I'm Shane Metcalf, co-founder of 15.5. Please come say hi to us at the booth. And thank you so much.